It's wonderful to be here. Thanks very much to Jonathan and Sandra from Kellogg and to our colleagues at African <coughs> Studies uh, who are co-organizers of this event, um, inviting us all the way from Johannesburg to be here with you. It's great to be at Oxford. Pity about the weather. But uh, this is something we have to, my wife tells me every morning, it's th 35 degrees back in Durban where we live. And, uh, you know, all the stories about the cat playing and the fine weather. Uh, we have to live with that. Anyway, what I will do um, is, yes, it is a book. It's a lengthy book with many complex arguments over long historical time. So I can do no more than kind of sketch some of the main arguments of the book. Uh, I'm not going to have a chance to drill down to any aspects of it. But Robbie will speak on a few issues at slightly late, greater length. Uh, but overall, the balance between us is that I will speak for a slightly longer time, just so that you're aware uh, of the way in which the time is going to be split. Uh, unfortunately, the books themselves are not here. They are held out, held up in some kind of health uh, issue at customs. So that's the latest we heard this afternoon. Um, that, that there's uh, bricks. <laughs> yeah, if you had not have to comply with European Union regulations, maybe the books would have been here, but they're not. Anyway, they're going to be available at uh, Blackwell's and through Eurospan. And there's a flyer on your table, on your chair, um, with all the details. And I hope that uh, you'll be able to, if you're interested enough from what we say, uh, find a time and um, resources to buy it. <coughs> so yes, we're not going to talk a lot about post-apartheid South Africa. This is essentially the story of what happened leading up to 1990 and what happened during the negotiations, particularly in respect of social and economic policy. So just to correct, it's, it's, we're not going to say too much about what has been going on now. That's less uh, it's, it's very sad, but less interesting intellectually, if you like, or politically. So widespread, widespread perceptions exist today, 25 years after democracy, and as the economy struggles to gain any traction, that our political leaders sold out the poor and the working class in the negotiations for a new democratic South Africa in the early to mid-90s. Language couched in terms of betrayal, and sell out abound, as do claims of some kind of conspiracy involving Western countries and agencies that defanged the ANC and turned its an emancipatory policy framework on social and economic matters towards neoliberalism and the Washington Consensus. How true is any or all of this? Our book takes a long historical approach, trying first to fathom from the mass of contradictory and confusing policy stances over 50 years, basically a kind of post-war story, of what the ANC stood for in terms of economic and social policy transformation. And Robbie will speak at greater depth about that context, if you like, of, of what the ANC's vision and uh, emancipatory uh, plan, if you like, for the future was. And secondly, we go on in the book to explore why this policy stance changed in the hurly-burly of the negotiations as widely believed and claimed. We don't fully buy the claims of betrayal, sellout, or conspiracy. The case, in some instances, remains unproven. And it's not that we've actually suggested that they didn't happen or happen. But we can understand why people actually make such claims, why they are being made, arguably, with increasing, increasing stridency and even, in some cases, with violence. We maintain that a lot more research is needed from scholars from all disciplinary perspectives, including but not limited to economic sociology, po politics, law, and philosophy, in order to provide more granularity and depth to the study of South Africa's celebrated negotiated revolution. There is a growing recognition among South Africans of different ideological stances that we would like to know more about what really transpired in the largely secret negotiations over South Africa's democracy in the early to mid-1990s. Critical policies and principles were agreed to between the two major parties to the negotiations, the ANC and the Nationalist Party government, in what are called bilaterals, which are poorly recorded, if at all. And I've spent a lot of time in the archives 
trying to actually find out what really happened. We have, for example, a whole chapter in the book um, trying to fathom how it came about that the South African Reserve Bank was granted its independence as enshrined in sections 223 to 225 of the Constitution. But we are as yet to get to the bottom of the story. Who mooted the step, which was at the time extremely unusual, and why? A September 2019 article in the official organ of the South African Communist Party sets out the party's current take on what transpired during the 1990s negotiations, which I'll quote from because it's evidence of what, in fact, many in both officially in the party as well as many in the ANC believe happened. Quote, in the mid-90s, the specter of declining foreign currency reserves, inflation, and a supposed debt cliff were used to herd us into the neoliberal gear macroeconomic policy, itself borrowed largely from the outgoing government's normative economic model published in 1993. In the mid-90s, the quote goes on, while the SACP and broader left forces opposed the gear package, this is the growth employment and redistribution strategy of the new government, we were unable to mount an effective macroeconomic counter. This was partly due to the fact that we were up against the combined weight of established monopoly capital, the mainstream media and their commentariat, and critically, key ANC personnel now in Treasury and the Reserve Bank, who had been carefully cultivated by the likes of Goldman Sachs. This was at the time when neoliberalism was globally at its most triumphalist. This is the stance of the official alliance partner of the ANC and of a large chunk of the ANC itself, not the, the faction that has been dominant for quite a while. Our arguments in the book are similar, though obviously expectedly much more evidence-based and hopefully richer, more nuanced and more detailed. But there's no doubt, of course, that the ANC triumphed at the political aspects of the negotiations and arrived at a celebrated constitution which contained most of what it had struggled for since its birth in 1912. This was a tribute to the hugely talented cadres and strategists in its negotiating team. Cyril Ramaphosa, the president now, Mac Maraj, Praveen Gordon, LB Sachs, Carter Asmal, among others on the ANC side, were streets ahead of the Nationalist Party negotiating capabilities. Neither was de Klerk much focused on the economy. A peace settlement and the formation of a government of national unity were uppermost in the minds of both of the two major parties to the negotiations, as against, again confirmed by recent interviews that we held with both former ministers on the Nationalist Party side and we were uh, lucky to have actually given, been given two hours of the time of the former president himself. This is de Klerk. But on economic policy and technical matters, the real brains lay not with the leadership of the politics, but with the government's liberal economic, so-called liberal economic technocrats, including Derek Keyes, pluck from the mining giant Gencore to head the trade ministry, and then later finance, Vim de Villiers, also an ex-Gencore CEO, who was appointed public enterprise minister Chris Stahls, who stayed on as an influential governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Estian Karlitz, the Director General of Finance across the transition, and supporting actors including Simon Brunt at the influential policy think tank, the Development Bank, Jan Lombard, the Deputy Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, and the author of the Hayekian-inspired book, Freedom, Welfare and Order, and Flip Smith, the demographer and former Vice Chancellor of Pretoria University, who played an important role in establishing the boundaries and fiscal powers of the nine provinces of South Africa. These technocrats, more market orientated, verluchte, enlightened Afrikaner economists and scientists, many inter interesting with PhDs from the US and UK, had begun to shift the direction of economic policy away from its dirigist past since the early 1980s. By the time negotiations began, they had already left an almost unshakable mark on the economic policy landscape with the 1993 normative economic model as its centerpiece. By contrast, the AN said historically little, paid little or no attention to, the, to matters of the economy. It did set up something called the Macroeconomic Research Group, which I'll talk about soon, but it then 
actually decided to its, um, in its, for its own logic to ditch that. To its credit, the ANC delivered a constitution that appeared to capture the values and spirits of the struggle for freedom and equality. It is peppered with direct and implied commitments to social and economic justice in order to turn around the lives of those millions of South Africans who had endured centuries of both economic and political oppression, exploitation, indignity, and inequality. Yet there was no mechanism built into the negotiations which linked these fine constitutional principles and values to the processes of policy formulation on social and economic policy. As social justice activist Mark Hayward observed in a recent review of our book, quote, as a social justice activist and constitutionalist, one of the things I looked for in Shadow of Liberation was evidence that the ANC had tied the constitution-making process to a consideration of economic policy that would advance its objectives. I was disappointed. In fact, as former Deputy Chief Justice Dihang Mosaneki has confirmed in his memoir, My Own Liberator, Lawmaking and economic policy making followed parallel processes, never crossing each other. The negotiators did not stare in the eye of the historical structural inequality in the economy. There was no pact on how to achieve the equality and social justice the Constitution promised. Not only do we argue that the ANC sharply veered away from its historical emancipatory agenda, it also failed to engage its own people democratically on the necessity for and form and content of policy change. We make a big point in the book about the ANC's failure to debate policy democratically, in sharp contrast to the democratic traditions of other progressive social form formations inside South Africa, including the United Democratic Front, the kind of internal wing of the ANC before it was unbanned, and COSATU, the Trade Union Federation. Over 30 years ago, the post-Keynesian scholar Hyman Minsky wrote, quote, economic issues must become a serious public matter and the subject of debate if new directions are to be taken. Meaningful reforms cannot be put over by an advisory and administrative elite that is itself the architect of the existing situation. But that tragically, it seems, is what unfolded in South Africa. The developments in South Africa in the early, early to mid-90s occurred and unfolded in the context of a post-Cold War era. Berkeley sociologist Michael Burroi has described the shift in ANC economic policy thinking as follows. Without a critical stance towards Soviet socialism, having never partaken in the debates about the meaning of socialism, real and imaginary, the liberation movement in power found itself without a cognitive map to navigate the enormous problems of national reconstruction. An exodus without a map became vulnerable to a neoliberal redemption, especially when the entire globe was spellbound by the magic of the market. Veteran ANC activist Ben Turok makes, points out that alternatives did exist. There were indeed critical voices that sought to introduce more ra radical economic and social policies, which were rejected by the top leadership of the ANC. The Reconstruction and Development Program, which was agreed to in February 1994, was one such voice, which was soon closed down completely on spurious grounds. There were others, this is Ben Turok continuing, there were others such as Merg, the Macroeconomic Research Group. Turok's conclusion, the main problem seemed to be that the leadership did not have a sense of what economic development meant and how it could be promoted. Understanding the issue of South Africa's indebtedness at the cusp of the transition is, we argue, crucial to making sense of the economic policies that were followed. And I can't develop this argument fully, but I set out the kind of perspective on debt as former fi as Finance Minister Trevor Manuel argues, a kind of argument that completely ruled out um, any state-led policy options on the grounds that there was no money. The fiscal, the magnitude of the fiscal crisis as, descri as described by people like Trevor Manuel appear to suggest that the new government had little or no option but to swing behind the only game in town, a Washington consensus approach to economic reform in which the developmental role of the state was almost totally exercised. Yet, Stellenbosch University economist Estienne Karlitz, 
for himself a former DG of Treasury, Stan Duplessis and Krika Siebritz make the following important observation in an article in the South African Journal of Economics. And um, cutting through a long quote, let me just say this. So precipitous, they say, was the perceived trend in public debt that economists at the time and in subsequent years feared the onset of a debt trap. In this note, in their article, we re revisit this issue and illustrate how a revised calculation of the evolution of South African public debt since the 1960s leads to different conclusions. The analysis is built upon how the obligations res related to the government employees' pe pension fund and the implications of the reincorporation of the homelands affected the, f the fiscal crisis at the time of the transition. The adjusted data suggest that the sense of imminent fiscal crisis during the mid-1990s and the harsh judgment on pre-1994 fiscal discipline requires some revision. I want to talk a little bit about MERG, the Macroeconomic Research Group, and we are very lucky that the academic director of MERG, John Sender, is here with us this evening. Pushed by the Canadians in late 1990 to come up with a more sophisticated and modelled macro policy framework, Nelson Mandela drove the establishment of the Macroeconomic Research Group that had at its, has had as its patron Oliver Tambo, and which was led by Oliver Tambo's great friend and comrade Vela Pele, with the support of some 85 progressive and anti-apartheid economists and social scientists from around the world. So as economists John Sender, Ben Fine, Lawrence Harris were among the members of the Merg team. Their thorough research grounded in the actual realities of the history and current state of the South African economy at the time and based on the broad values and principles of the ANC as we as understood by the Merg researchers was launched as a 330 page report on the 3rd of December 1993. The theoretical foundations of the Merg economic policy framework lie in what we would characterize as a broadly Cambridge or structuralist approach in the tradition of Keynes, Robinson, Caldo, and Kaletsky, where effective demand failures and the possibility of below full employment equilibrium are recognized as key problems. Merg envisaged a two-phase crowding-in approach to South African development, a state-led social and physical infrastructure investment program focusing on housing, education, health, and physical infrastructure investment on which detailed chapters were provided as the growth drivers in the first phase, followed by a more sustainable growth phase that would result in private sector investment kicking in more forcefully as growth picked up. Crucially, as the Merg modeling and the simulation, simulations carefully crafted and led by Australian modeler Peter Brain showed, the approach was fully consistent with the required macroeconomic balances. John Sender, writing in the Journal of Southern African Studies in 1994, reminded us of the core assumption underlying the Merg framework. Far from ignoring the determinants of private sector investment, the Merg framework places the long-standing and continued refusal of the private sector to invest its burgeoning financial surpluses productively at the center of its analysis. The rationale for Merg's gradualistic framework is the explicit judgment that domestic investors will remain uncertain about long-term economic prospects and the equally explicit recognition that the risk aversion of large corporations may depress their industrial investment. With idle cash balances in South Africa's companies' balance sheets estimated today to be approaching 3 trillion rand, it is not difficult to see how right the Merg authors were in their assumptions about the likelihood of private sector invest in investing in a democratic South Africa in the early years of the transition. But sadly, that effective capital strike continues today, 25 years later. On the 3rd of December 1993, the Merg policy framework was presented to the world at the Rosebank Hotel where it was effectively disavowed by the ANC policymakers present. Ben Fine, who was one of the Merg's co-authors, looking back at all this, has recently observed, a long sequence of wit witnesses for the prosecution uniformly marched into the discussion of the document and routinely and ridiculously rubbished it in what could only have been a, law, a badge of loyalty. I must have mentioned that I was simply bewildered at the time. It came as a great shock. We didn't know anything about what was going on in the informal negotiations. And suddenly, some 20 years later, I sort of looked back on this and came to the conclusion that actually there was a political decision 
to disown and ostracize basically the whole Merg project and report. That was really indicative of the huge change that had taken place in the policy arena in the previous six months, so that the Merg report, once the centerpiece of the ANC's post-apartheid thinking on the economy was perceived and the process was seen as some kind of embarrassment in the direction of the ANC leadership at the time. As senior uh, ANC activist and former minister Ronnie Casserells put it, Trevor Manuel, who was then the head of the ANC's Department of Economic Policy, Trevor Manuel formally thanked them and then imperiously consigned them to a footnote in history. He virtually told them to go to hell. As political scientists Peter Vale and Georgina Barrett uh, note, the formal embrace of neoliberalism came in 1996, two years after South Africa's democratic election, when Deputy President Mbeki, effectively Mandela's Prime Minister, announced the adoption of a new economic problem, a program called the Growth, Employment and Redistribution Policy, an acronym which is very unusual in the sense that it had virtually failed in every one of those key drivers. Very low growth, <coughs> rising unemployment, and redistribution of no substance whatsoever to the extent that South, Africa in South Africa's income inequality is now widely regarded as among the worst in the world. Much was made then, of course, of the success of the ANC's chosen economic policy in, res in respect of restoring this magic macroeconomic balance. Yes, the budget de deficit to GDP ratio and the inflation rate did start to fall after 1994. But it is instructive to note that even in the period of some economic success, that what we would describe as post-apartheid South Africa's golden years from 2001 to 2007, even in that period, South African unemployment has remained stubbornly high and rising. In 2001, at the beginning of that period, the unemployment rate stood at 25.4. That's just the official calculation. And in, that, in 2007, at the end of that period, it still stood at 22.3. This compared to just 16.9 in 1995, at the beginning of the transition to democracy, and to 29.1% formally today, closer to 38% if you include the discouraged workers who are who are not taken uh, into account in the calculations. Some scholars have placed the blame for the policy shift at the door of the IMF and the so-called conditionalities imposed through the uh, facility agreed to in December 1993 by the Transitional Executive Council, which was this, uh, this set up to level the playing fields be before democracy. In a recent paper in the Review of African Political Economy, Ben Fine and I demolish this argument. We don't believe it has any particular substance. In our work, instead, Robbie and I uh, develop a kind of uh, make, expose and make explicit the more influential role played both by South African capital, big business in South Africa, and by key reform-minded bureaucrats and technocrats in the old apartheid state in shifting the views of the weak, unevenly trained, and inexperienced ANC economics team during the critical years of the transition to democracy. And that's the team that was in the political, in the in, in Lutuli House, if you like, in the, in the political domain. In his back, so that's the, essentially this, the, the book revolves around a detailed analysis of some particular policy stances in respect of health, in respect of central bank independence, and so on and about the macroeconomic policy framework in which you can actually tease out these different forces, if you like, um, underlying the policy shift that occurred. In his back cover endorsement, political scientist Professor Tom Lodge has described our book as a, quote, an economist detective story. So let me stop here before I give away the whole plot and spoil your read. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for colleagues. Thank you for Jonathan and Sandra Gee and the team for making us very really welcome back here. Myself in Oxford after many years. I spent 13 years as a scholar here. And i uh, pleased to acknowledge my then doctoral supervisor, Gavin Williams, who in some of the ideas that expressed in my talk here, which covers some aspects of, 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 of the book,
uh, Gavin was foundational in helping me think through the importance of the early ANC, in particular thinker and leader called A.B. Kuma for the genesis of, of ideas in, through social policy on the good society. And I'm ever grateful for that. In fact, the past 25 years of scholarship has been precisely been trying to underpack that. So thank you, Gavin, for that. And good to see younger scholars, uh, Irfan and Leila Strelitzi as well. They're the new generation of South African uh, students who I think will take up some of these, these concerns as we try to evolve a new agenda. So in the time available, I want to draw attention to the evolution of what I describe as social democratic policy thinking in the ANC and what this suggested of the ANC's views since the 1940s on ideas of the good society. And I think this is important because what visioners provide us was an overview of the economic policy debate and how this evolved. And what I'd like to do, and partly is out of despair about where the ANC is at, that we can't imagine that the ANC was an organization of ideas. It actually stood for something that we could broadly describe as emancipatory. And as we get ever more lurid accounts of the scale of corruption, as you see in the Zondo Commission, some of you, um, and you know, just the evisceration of any emancipatory agenda as suggested by where the ANC is at now, that we can think back that actually the ANC was an organization of ideas, even if imperfectly formulated, the ideas were there. And the essence of the argument in the book here on this matter, and presented in truncated form due to restrictions of time, is that the post-apartheid ANC, the current ANC, rejected a firmly social democratic alternative in the historical vein of the post-war Labour government of Clement Attlee. And that again, I'll emphasize it, the historical vein, the emphasis, the impetus of what Clement rep Attlee represented in the time, in favor of a klepto kleptocratic capitalism. And yet, notwithstanding the extraordinary expenditure in the post-apartheid era on welfare, expenditure uh, which in the Zuma years became an intrinsic feature and not an exception in our view of the project of kleptocratic capitalism referred to ironically in the end as black economic empowerment. So to say that the ANC as a liberation movement historically did not develop detailed social policy alternatives in health and welfare, that's my own area of, of scholarly work, of the post-apartheid society would correspond with the evidence available as none such detailed proposals could be found. However, the ANC did have ideas, values and principles which articulated a vision of the post-segregation and subsequently post-apartheid society. The first incarnation of this is arguably found in its modern form in the 1943 policy statement of the ANC called African Claims. The African Claims document was a response to the anti-fascist 1941 Atlantic Charter of the Allied Forces in the Second World War, which charted a new world order based on democratization of societies under Nazi domination and the extension of welfare and labor rights globally. The convergence on the need in this period for fundamental social reforms in South Africa between the Kuma-led ANC and the segregationist liberal white ruling United Party of Smuts was made possible by the acceptance of these Atlantic Charter provisions. Both groups, for very different strategic reasons, hoped the implementation of the Atlantic Charter <coughs> would be beneficial for a post-war South Africa. The strategic genius of the then leader of the ANC in the 1940s, Alfred Bettini Kuma, a public health medical doctor by training and perhaps the most significant foundational thinker of the modern ANC, followed by Albert Lutuli and then Nelson Mandela to some significant extent, was to firmly embed the African claims policy statement in the broadly social democratic impulse of the Atlantic Charter. Of relevance to social policy, African claims call for political rights, in other words, the extension of democracy on the basis of an unqualified franchise, the extension of civil rights, being the right to form and participate in political organization and freedom, such as that of association and the press, and finally and most significantly, the extension of social rights of citizenship to include free comprehensive education, for blacks to be included equally in a state welfare scheme, and also the right to universal health care, the latter of which took the explicit institutional form of a national health service. That is a state-provided system of national public health care 
provided free at the point of delivery. The ANC, in other words, in the mid-1940s, was advocating for the rights-based provision of social policies in health and education, protected for and provided by a democratic state to all citizens, regardless of their social status and the relationship to the labor market. Here are the seeds of the social democratic thinking in the ANC in substance, even if never ideologically claimed as such in form. It must be acknowledged that the ANC in its advocacy of a national health service on the UK model of Attlee's Labour Party, with his health reform proposals championed by the gifted Labour politician Anirin Bevan, himself having roots and a worldview uncompromisingly embedded in the socialism of the Welsh working class he stemmed from, in fact drew its original inspiration from the 1942 to 1944 Gluckerman Commission on a National Health Service of the segregationist Smuts government. The Liberal Henry Gluckman, as Minister of Health, was the first to advocate detailed proposals for a state-run South African National Health Service in which the ultimate intention was to socialize South African health care on a democratic basis. It still arguably remains the most audacious experiment in social policy making in South African history and enjoyed unique cross-party support in the minority white political establishment, including the support of Karl Bremer, a visionary public health advocate of the National Party and himself an unequivocal and staunch supporter of Gluckman. However, the African claims proposals nonetheless came to naught as blacks were denied the franchise, perhaps evidence of the potent argument of T.H. Marshall that political and civil rights were a necessary condition for establishing social rights of citizenship. In echo also of the current dilemma in South Africa of establishing a universal health care service through an NHI, National Health Insurance, Gluckman argued then, in the 1940s, that a necessary precondition for establishing a national health service in South Africa was to remove the responsibility for tertiary health care or the big hospitals from the then four provincial administrations which drained fiscal resources away from the local level public health care centres that Gluckman was advocating as the foundation for the new national public health care system. <coughs> Smuts at the time balked at the suggestion as it would upset the careful political balance in the provinces that maintained his majority and, effect and effectively torpedoed the Gluckman NHS proposals. <clears throat> the same problem of universalizing healthcare today in South Africa across the nine provinces with radically uneven capacity, that is the provinces, confronts the current Ramaphosa administration of the ANC in its attempts to reform the healthcare system in a more egalitarian direction, but with the added problem of the corruption of state institutions. Little, therefore, is being learned from the history of healthcare reform in South Africa today. Nonetheless, the social democratic ideas in social policy were again picked up by the ANC in the mid-1950s under the leadership of Albert Lutuli. Lutuli explicitly referred to himself as a Christian socialist. Perhaps the Fabian socialism of the celebrated Richard Tony is the closest approximation of what he meant. And Latuli is on record on a number of occasions as saying further that his political model for a post-apartheid South Africa was Clement Attlee's welfare state, and that he was an Attlee man, and had he pre been presented with the opportunity, he would unhesitatingly have voted for the post-war Labour Party in Britain. Here, it is important to note and elaborate it in our book that the ANC under the leadership of Kuma and Latuli was an organisation which was inspired by the big ideas circulating in the global arena about the post-war redistributive good society and its leaders moreover who represented values of selfless integrity to support the principles of a broadly social democratic good society in South Africa that underpin these values. Specifically the ANC codified its social democratic thinking in a 1955 document called the Freedom Charter which in its proposals for social policy reflected direct continuity with the African claim statement of the 1940s. It did this by continuing to argue, amongst other, for free compulsory and universal education and state-subsidized higher education, and again, a state-provided national health service providing universal health care to all the citizens. Importantly, the Freedom Charter framed its social policy provisions, again specifically in a rights-based language. The provision of such social rights to health and education left no room or role for the market. Indeed, a decommodifying impetus was advocated by the Freedom Charter, but also argue, and I quote, that the state shall recognize 
the right and duty of all to work. An extraordinary demand in retrospect. And furthermore, contained demands about the control of the wealth of the country, which presuppose some form of public ownership of such wealth. This, uh, however, is not to suggest the Freedom Charter advocated a socialist alternative. It also contained individual rights perfectly compatible with a liberal democracy. This subsequently can also be viewed as a great strength of the Charter. Lutuli as leader of the ANC until his suspicious death in 1967 is again important for championing the social democratic impetus. First, by skillfully convincing the ANC to adopt the Freedom Charter at its annual meeting in 1955, the dispute within the ANC being over the economic clause on nationalization, and secondly, and in the period of his award of a Nobel Prize in 1962, making a major statement entitled, If I Was Prime Minister. In this statement, Latouli presented a veritable blueprint for the establishment of what he described, and I quote, a democratic social welfare state, and which closely mirrored the key provisions again of the post-war British welfare state, but also now included social compacting type accords between labor, the state, and business, the inspiration of which was Sweden and with the important fiscal injunction that the establishment of a democratic social welfare state in South Africa should not cripple industry. The Freedom Charter, the most important symbolic statement of the ANC on a future good society, <coughs> becomes subsumed, however, after the banning of the ANC in 1961 under the primary objective of establishing a democratic state in the context of intensified repression on the part of the apartheid regime following the Sharpeville massacre in 1960. So now, with little time left to say anything about what happened to these rich and imaginative and indeed indigenized social democratic ideas in the ANC, I will leave it as a controversial concluding statement, and that is to say the ANC abandoned an imaginative and realizable social, social South African Fabian socialism by 1961 for a turgid and unimaginative Soviet-style template of quote-unquote Marxism-Leninism which I must myself take a fair deal of responsibility for promoting in the time. Uh, albeit, I would say, with the rare exception of two thinkers, Jabalani Nobelbo Kamalo, uh, referred to by his nom de guerre, Comrade Mzala, and Paolo Jordan. This Marxism-Leninism proved in the end a very poor replacement for the social democratic trajectory of thinking firmly established under Albert Latouli and which, in reincarnated form, that's the Marxism-Leninism, in quote, at the level of authoritarian political practice, perhaps read Stalinist, if you will, under Tavo in Beki in the post-apartheid era, were to be devastating for establishing the universal democratic social welfare state, protecting of rights of social citizenship and individual civic and political freedoms that inspired Albert Lutuli originally. The disastrous implications of this social democratic impetus not flourishing and gaining momentum in the democratic era is spelled out in detail in our book. Thank you. I must say that I'm staggered at the depth of research you've done and also staggered at the amount of information you, you gave us this evening. Um, I've always been aware of the stranglehold of capitalism and big business on the economy of South Africa. So I'm rather su surprised that the government in waiting hadn't kind of prepared themselves to tackle that in a way, but okay. So I think I'll open up to questions from the floor now, if that's okay with you. Yes, so here we go. It's your turn. Thank you. How much is the book? <laughs> How much is the book? How much does uh, the book cost? <coughs> I'm not sure what the pound price on in South Africa. It's selling at 350 to 380 rand. So yes. that's about what? Uh, 17 pounds? Yeah. 15 pounds. 15 pounds. 15. Yeah, I, I, I looked it up. It's actually a lot more. It's, it's one of these academic prices, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah because it's it academic libraries. Yeah. When I looked it up, it was something in the 60s. 
Wow. That, that, that's the, the hardback version, which is oh, like is a trick. Yeah, the, uh, the what's going to be sold is the paperback version. Oh, so it is yeah, paperback. if you if you Google, if you go into one of these uh, book selling websites, it'll only show you the hardback version. Uh -huh. I tried that myself, it's and it's sixty dollars, sixty pounds plus. Yeah, I think, yeah. which is which is what American libraries can buy it at, sure. but very few others. Yeah, and it will certainly be higher than the South African price if the South African price works out at fifteen or sixteen pounds. It will certainly be more here. Sure, yeah. But okay, there we go. Under twenty quid, I reckon. <laughs> yes, sir. It's a question for from this. Go on away. Yeah, so I'm just getting a copy of the junction of my co-author. So yeah. run away. <laughs> no, just, just, just to show you the book in the paperback version. <laughs> Here we go. That's what it looks like in soft bars. Yeah, it looks just like that. <laughs> <laughs> But I want to elaborate on more tentative comments towards the end, uh, the direction the ANC took in its exile period. And I, I'm not quite sure what the gist of the argument is. Are you saying that because it moved to the left, away from the social democratic vision that was held by Truman, Natuli, and others? that by the time it got to the negotiations, at a time in the 90s when the world was simply not able to cater for those sorts of ideas, they were so summarily dismissed. In other words, the ANC was trapped in a Marxist ideas, which simply had no purchase in the reality of the negotiations. And therefore, that's why it had no basis around the social term democratic or developmentalist approach. Because in, in some ways that's just what I would say. <coughs> Yet the forces within the ANC which had stronger left opinions um, remained in, in the alliance and especially for Sartre. Mm -hmm. And in some ways the, the issue seems slightly other. In other words, those ideas do continue to be expressed with some force. So <clears throat> I suppose I'm making, uh, thanks for that, that's a very important question. I think I'm saying something perhaps more specific. I'm saying that the, the, the brand of Marxist thinking that the ANC in the end came to espouse, particularly after Marogoro in 1969, was a variant of Stalinism and Stalinist thinking, which embedded a lot of authoritarian political practices distinctive from, and this is, we go into this more in the book, distinctive from the trajectory established internally in South Africa under the United Democratic Front, which also had a socialist uh, impulse, which also had strong Marxist uh, impulse, impulses. Part of it was linked to the Marxism-Leninism of the established CP, the Communist Party. But there was also a tradition of more uh, open-minded thinking about socialist possibilities associated with the new left, for example, and particularly that came out of sections of uh, the, the university movement, the student movement, and so forth. And the translation of that, what I call now, and I, I, again, I will, I, will, I, will, I will own that by saying myself, I was a Marxist-Leninist activist, very closely associated with the, with the SSCP. Uh, although I was an above ground UDF activist, didn't allow for a, an indigenous thinking around the socialist project to emerge that had its roots originally in African claims and the Freedom Charter. And so me doing research in this area, I found this rich tradition of thinking. One of the questions I asked is, where did Latuli engage these ideas around Africa? Because particularly in his articles, absolutely clear he's thinking about this in a very, very thoughtful way. And distinctive from, at that time, what the party was about, the Communist Party, in terms of how it was espousing a certain kind of third international template, kind of communist international uh, Marxist politics. And of course, linked around the ideas of a national democratic revolution, a two-state theory. When I think, in fact, the possibilities suggested by the thinking of Truman and Latuli around a viable social democratic possibility and what I would call now a democratic socialism 
was displaced precisely because of that Marxist, Leninist, Stalinist mm -hmm. politics of the party, which then in the uh, transition era <coughs> becomes to be reinforced. And this is a very crude way of expressing it. There's more nuance to it, but essentially an exile community who taking the take on the symbolic reins of the ANC, which the UDF and activists in the UDF were seeing these white these knights in white shining armor coming to liberate us and forgo everything, abandon everything to this leadership corps, whose style of politics was distinguishable by the fact that uh, it was authoritarian and perhaps partly accounted for by the clandestine nature of working in exile against a very repressive regime, which was intent on killing them. Um, but it didn't allow for the flourishing of democratic politics, the impetus of which I would argue, and perhaps even, even if imperfectly, was the cornerstone of the UDF. So I, 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 I have a problem with the Marxism-Leninism of the party expressing a Stalinist form. That's really what I'm talking about. It's not a problem to say of Marxism. Thank you. Can everybody hear? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. This gentleman. Well, the fascinating account of that indigenized line of thought from the ANC. I wondered while you were talking whether there's any other indigenous tradition that we might identify. I'm thinking of the hostility to um, the, the Moscow line from an alternative left in South Africa, or the international unity movement, etc., etc. All of those groupings with some very significant um, intellectuals amongst them. Was there, among their writings, any kind of equivalent um, championing of socio-economic rights of not necessarily social democracy, but of this vein of thought around social economic rights? Well, I think in response, if I could just make a quick response, uh, Colin, I do think there was, but it took the form of critique. So if you look at the work of Ivy Tabata, who is part of Abdusa, he was talking about education as barbarism through the critique suggesting an alternative, but I don't think it was explicitly formulated as an alternative. It's not something I could see in a, in, in a, uh, from my own reading, and I need to do more reading on this. In fact, the research question that, pop, that comes that emerges for me is why didn't the social democratic current of thought flourish? Um, and that takes us into interesting spheres. We have to revisit the role of the Liberal Party because there you found a possible coalescence of thinking around even a weak form of social democracy. I think of Randall Vine, think of the African resistance movement. All of these are just dismissed as reformist, as bad guys. They kind of going, they only want to go halfway. But in the context of the times and from the lens of 30 years later, perhaps themselves being possibly part of a social alliance coherent around a social democratic possibility. So it forces me to go there to now reread some of this literature to better understand it. And I think perhaps also, if I can just conclude by saying, perhaps the most forcible critique of the, of the idea that the ANC was dominated by CP activists, I think there was a different tradition of thinking in the ANC, distinctive from what was happening in the party, notwithstanding the phenomenal role of activists like Ruth First, Hilda Bernstein, Rusty Bernstein, who I would hold as deeply ethical communists, distinctive from some of the other communists who were in the party, who were met much more part of what I would describe as a kind of closed Stalinist agenda. Unethical communist. How did the Model C system prevail? The Model C, which was, in my understanding, introduced by the African National Government to schools so that white schools could essentially set up um, criteria um, for admissions of children and then allowed to charge. That seems deeply exclusionary mm -hmm. to surely the majority of young people and mm -hmm. poor young people. And that, when we think of the kind of people who are falling out of work mm -hmm. and of all classes, who now their children do not have access to very basic education yeah. and good education. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Well, it came specifically out of a case in the mid-1990s about the school who wanted to have control of appointments through the school governing body and who took the then government to court 
And in the context of politics of the time, I think there was an attempt to appease, quote unquote, the broad middle class or lower middle class, if you will, to give them an option to improve the quality of schooling in the context of what was happening in township schools. So it was a compromise. I think, in fact, the illustration is part of a bigger problem in South Africa around policy making, that 95% of our policy making has been about the problem of poverty and only 5% about the problem of inequality. The problem of inequality is a new discovery in South Africa, a lot of it actually burgeoning with the Lisa Thomas Piketty's book in a few years ago. And the issue there, of course, when you talk about inequality, you're talking about the relationships between social strata and how good public goods are either defended or not in terms of mechanisms of distribution and redistribution. And that was not an agenda that Tabu Mbeki was in, at any level interested in. And so therefore you force back to a residualist understanding of how you deal with quote unquote the problem of poverty. And now the key issue in South Africa, the, the policy issue is around reforming how the healthcare system. And you find the, the middle class are deeply mobilized around this because this proposal is challenging inequality in, in, in the sense that part of the argument that to achieve a universal healthcare system in South Africa, you're going to get, you have to take away from the middle class the 16% of the privileged part of that society that has access to private healthcare provision through subsidized provision from the state in the form of medical aids. You have to take it away from them. It amounts to 40 billion. And so the middle class are now mobilized. The debate is dominated by the middle class. It says the public healthcare system is in a mess. It's in total chaos. We can't go there. Please don't touch, our, we the privileged 16% don't touch our access to private healthcare. Which of course in itself is also a problem because that private healthcare is deeply commodified. People pay four times more uh, in the private healthcare system in South Africa than they ordinarily pay on, say for example, in the British NHS. Mm. But what this is bringing to the surface, and again I must myself take some responsibility for this because I worked in policy over a long period. Uh, is and Titmus alerts us to which Titmus alerts us to the problem of creating services for the poor, they become poor services. So what you're making is an illustration of that. That failed decision around transforming the education system reinforced the forms of inequality, although it appeased the middle class's need to guarantee for their children some quality of education within their means. It's a much bigger issue that's implicated in, in, the, in the thing that you... I think the about. issue of education is huge. I've just come back from working at in a school near Alice in the Eastern Cape. And, I mean, I can't begin to tell you the poverty, the just general sense of degradation, the, the lack of anything, apart from someone alive standing in front of a class of children. Um, it's quite humbling in a way. I'll just make anyway. one comment on the education thing. Yeah. And it just links up what I was saying about the constitution and so on. We had a very interesting interview recently with Ruth Mayer. Ruth Mayer was together with Cyril Ramaphosa, the two major negotiators in the transition era. And Ralph Mayer said to us that immediately after the interim constitution was agreed to by all the parties, he and the current president <coughs> went to see the ANC and national party leaders and suggested that four serious policy matters be given consideration immediately after the constitution was approved. Firstly was economic policy, secondly was education, thirdly was black economic empowerment and transformation, and fourthly was the matter of the capacity of the South African state in the democratic era to, to do anything. How do we transform the state? This was taken to the ANC guys led by Tabo Mbeki simply said, no way. Okay. This is not a matter for the negotiating teams. It is going to be decided by the democratic government. In other words, I will decide in, in, in Tabo's sort of way. So, I mean, those critical issues simply got left behind. And in the early, early after 96, they simply become completely relegated. The yes. quality, there's a lot of money being spent on education. Uh, and there's a lot of money going into social policy, uh, which is absolutely critical without those kind of grants to 
people who, are, you know, who are at various levels of disability, etc., but they would not survive. <coughs> and it's not a solution to the kind of, you know, challenges that they economy <coughs> faces. We need the economy yeah. to grow, and we need employment. And we also had a school here who hadn't received its funding since June. It's hard to keep something going. Mm -hmm. Yes, the gentleman. Thanks for a fascinating talk. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if a counterfactual like this is fair, but, but I was wondering if you could speak in more detail about um, how the major economic problems of the mid-1990s may have been tackled differently. Um, you know, the two great engines of employment throughout the 20th century, mining and agriculture, no longer work for a while by the mid-1990s. You know, much of the manufacturing industry was apartheid, decentralized, heavily subsidized business. There were very, very deep problems facing um, the production of, of jobs or labor markets, um, you know, going back to the early 1970s. I mean, what, what more concretely are you suggesting? You know, a, a high tariff economy? Um, I mean, what I, what you said was most interesting, I, it was also very abstract. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, the big, the rich details are not so much in this book, but in the macroeconomic research group as an alternative vision, if you like, uh, to, to the normative economic model of the previous government, which, you know, bears very close resemblance to what ends up in here. As I indicated, let's just take one step back. The, the, the basic assumption that those of us who were leading, and John and I were part of that team, leading the thinking working very closely with the ANC desks, if you like, for the different uh, areas such as health, education, the economy, etc., was our concern about investment in the new era. And there's very clear sense that there was likely to be some kind of uh, lack of enthusiasm by the private sector to invest. Therefore, it was essential to get growth and employment going through a public investment program, focusing on health, education, and and and, and infrastructure, social and and, infra and physical, and that's basically the model that was proposed. Now you say about mining, yeah, I mean all those realities about the you know the declining nature of mining globally, agriculture, etc. Um, you know. Those things we un understood in each area where they had to be taken into account. So, for example, in the way the Merg report was, was constructed is, what is the current situation in the economy and in this area? What is the <coughs> Nationalist Party's proposals in that area? What are our proposals in that area? And that was modeled you know, to produce the kind of investment that we believed was going to be essential to drive growth and investment. It's an assumption that if you don't do it in that way, the private sector is not going to see the benefits of investing. They have to, they have to be rising demand, if you like, and incomes and growth in, in, at some point, and that was not going to come from their investments, but from public investment. And this was, this was not like uh, something that we thought would just carry on indefinitely. If you look at and John can talk about the Ethiopian instance, and it's interesting in Ethiopia now, which has achieved remarkable growth rates over the last 10 years, something uh, around 10% per annum over an extended period, that it was exactly that kind of model, you know, from a very, very parlous situation, uh, given political will and a clear set of <coughs> implemental, Im implementable ideas, they were able to turn around that economy through a public investment-led program that has actually picked up the entire economy. Uh, and then you could crowd in investments in mining, in agriculture, and, and, what, and what have you. That, that, that's the kind of approach. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, of course, we, it, uh, it's easy to say, well, you know, we had an alternative, and it was better uh, than the gear model, et cetera. I think our major point is, in, in this book anyway, that there were alternatives to counter an argument that there is, there were no alternatives, and that the only alternative around was a kind of Washington consensus approach. And it was very difficult for anyone, really, to look at South Africa and the South African economy in the early 90s, with all the inequalities that were there in every aspect of economic and social life, 
to imagine that the private sector, the market left to itself. I'm not anti-market. I just see the limits and constraints of that, using that as a way of actually dealing with inequalities of the depth and severity of the kind that existed in South Africa. And that without any kind of very strong, clear public investment, which was not just throwing money at any problem, but you know, carefully crafted in terms of where it went and how and the sequencing and timing of, of investments, that you would get this kind of you know, growth that would take us out from where. It's hard to believe that a market-led economy, effectively the, what we got with gear, would deal with South African growth, inequality, and unemployment. And it is, you know, as Robbie was saying, the, 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 the severity of inequality in South Africa has been kind of, you know, it's almost like people just didn't see those kind of strong structural contrasts. And, you know, people thought about, looked, about, looked at poverty and few, few other things that looked like the right way to understand the situation. But those deep structural inequalities needed to be addressed. And, you know, and that, that's what I think there were alternatives to deal with that. And they were, they were simply not debated. And that's the other big point that we make in the book. And that is, I mean, people like Robbie and I, who grew up, you know, in the unions and in, and in the UDF and, and internal ANC, if you like, and we are deeply ANC people. Uh, this is not like an attack on something that yeah. that that yeah, is that is out there and is you know, that's the tradition we come from. It, it was enormously difficult for us, to, for us to write this book because we are dealing with people that our comrades, people who stood in the trenches at the worst times of apartheid. And yet we feel that it is necessary for us to actually make the statement. When we speak to our students, when we're out talking, I gave a talk to a mainly trade union grouping in Cape Town a few months ago on, the, on, on this book. The, 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 it, it is unbelievable the extent to which they, are, they have moved away from our kind of compromised language, which is all about making, you know, we, we find it difficult to say things that perhaps should be said, but they don't have any such reservations. When they say betrayal, they mean betrayal, sell out, you know, and in a sense, we stand back and say, oh, maybe we need to rethink about this and perhaps there's another way of dealing with it. So, you know, our criticism in the book may appear to be harsh, but there's nothing compared to what is now arising in South Africa. And that groundswell of criticism may lead who knows where. But you it's know. important to raise your voice, isn't mm -hmm. it? There's a question from the back there, please. Um, hi. So, for me, there's a couple of points that have picked up elements of what I want, what I want to speak about. The one is about Model C uh, education system, and the other one is about sort of uh, the focus on mining, agriculture, and manufacturing. Um, and if I just take us back to sort of the, land, the period of the Land Apportionment Act and a very deliberate government-driven policy to sort of um, to group the workforce in areas that were obviously leaning towards the, exp the full exploitation of mining and agriculture and all of that. And, and that at that time, that, that that was the government's focus as the world was sort of shutting South Africa out. South Africa then began, began this in, inward looking policy of, of, of being self sufficient, uh, of being very market driven. It, oh, it was market driven, but in a very inward looking kind of way. And so now, in criticizing uh, the thinking of the ANC, it's very difficult to on the one hand, say that, well, you're, you're, trying to, uh, to, you're trying to take over an economy that is almost capitalistic in one way, but you've got, uh, the idea is that you've, you've got are the polar opposite of that. And so what you then have is that during the negotiation process, the ones that align with the status quo in my assessment, tended to kind of win over because the ones that didn't tended to be too drastic. So 
the closer, the ones that aligned much closer, won throughout, not because they were sellouts or anything of the sort, but that was the easier, Boy. that was the easier solution to, di to, to deliver, if that makes sense. But if it was only a matter of how easy or difficult it is, then maybe the ANC should have just left things in the hands of the previous government and let them get on with it. The policy was essentially the same, uh, which is effectively what happened. And if you look there, the, you know, the similarities between the Nationalist Party's last proposals on the economy, the normative economic model, and the first economic proposals of the new government gear are remarkably similar. Now, now, so so, is it do, what the ANC's historical emancipatory vision was to bring about a qualitative change in the in the lives of the millions of South Africans who had invested their lives in the ANC, many dying, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, over a long period. The point about the, the revolution and change was surely to bring about a change, a material change in the quality of lives of those people. To simply leave the economic policy framework as it was, because there was, it was harder to think of alternatives, doesn't seem to me to be, you know, an attractive option, if you like. My evidence is that uh, the workforce of today still very much reflects the construction of 30, 40 years ago. There has not been deliberate or there haven't been policies. Okay, maybe there have been that haven't worn out, but the workforce is still largely uh, reflective of the attitudes 30, 40 years ago. And that is why it is hard to move the economy on to, to a state where it is more able to deal with the social imbalance that uh, has been historically created. So well, I'd agree with part of what you're saying. I mean, you know, that the fact that there is still a large, unskilled, um, you know, right. workforce that is perhaps not up to the task of a modern economy. People talk about the fourth industrial revolution. You know, every minister makes a speech in South Africa, talks about the fourth industrial revolution, and we don't even have a basic education system mm -hmm. that will allow us to come even one step closer towards, you know, being able to make a fourth industrial revolution work. So there's so much basic work has not happened. The training, huge amounts of money, talking about the workforce, go into things called the CETAs, the sector uh, you know, training initiatives uh, for each sector. There's a CETA, and lots of people get employed, and all of them have a CEO and a huge bureaucratic task force to administer training in that area, whether it's engineering or whatever. And the output of that is, you know, is 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 pathetic, really. I mean, you know, this is huge amounts of money going into things that has not transformed that labor force in the way that. I think you were implying. And doesn't that speak to the internal conflict or what appears to be the conflict within the ANC? Because there are those that want to be more, that want to see more fiscal discipline, that want to see a lot of these pro market uh, policies thrive, yet there are those within the ANC that think, well, no, 25 years later, we should be in a better position. We should have been. Uh, you see what I'm saying? <coughs> Probably you have a bit of it. I think I think we're going to have to um, call it an evening there, unless there's anybody else with a very pressing question. I dinner. This one here, Kevin. Well, I just put my brother there. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you hinted at the the role of the IMF. Uh, in, in, in some of the negotiations, what pressure was on the, on the negotiation committees, international pressure, and from the IMF for this policy change, or wasn't there any evidence of it? Um, well, there was this loan in 1993, while well, it was a facility that was signed off by something called the Transitional Executive Council. You know. In the lead-up to the democratic elections in April 1994, 
two major parties agreed to set up this thing called the Transitional Executive Council. It was a, a, a kind of instrument of governance that was attempting to level the playing fields, to use the language of the time, uh, in le the lead up to the, to the negotiations. That structure, which Sir Ramaphosa, Praveen Gordon, and others sat on as the top leadership of it, and I served on the finance subcommittee of that, that, that structure, that structure signed off on a loan of facility from the IMF. It was something called a compensatory financing compensatory and contingency financing facility. A lot has been made of that, 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 that loan and the so-called conditionalities associated with that loan. But Ben Fine and I have recently really looked at that very, very carefully, talked to, went back to the documentation, both in the National Treasury and at the IMF, about that loan. Quite clearly, it was something that, um, that was at the IMF was, was saying, well, you know, take this facility, use it in whatever ways you want. This is what it wanted you to do. The, the CCFF, by its nature, by definition, was a low or no conditionality loan facility. That was what it was structured in that way. And in fact, there was no conditionality if you drew within your quota. There's a, you know, all countries have quotas. And if you draw within your quota, there was no. Now, John will tell you, because he commented on that document, the so-called letter of intent that came from the IMF. And, and, and you know, John can speak to it if you like. But I, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that was full of very heavy conditionality, do this or you will not get that kind of stuff. It was, you know, it, we, had, it, it was, we softened some of the worst edges of it, but it was not a major thing. And the new government simply didn't draw down on it. So, you know, the argument that the IMF was able to use the CCFF facility, 830 million US, I think it was 850 million, is, was, is not the case. And we've actually checked all the, all the finance and the accounts. That facility was simply, uh, we, the new yes. government said no. There's this odd thing, I mean, I, many of us argued, why don't we take World Bank loans, use it for productive purposes, and simply tell the bank and the fund, look, just leave us alone. I mean, we had the bargaining power at the time to Mandela and so on to say, look, we need to actually yeah. do certain things to deal with the historical problems that we confronted. But it never came to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, you know, there are some people on the left who are very quick to say, it's the IMF that did it, you know? And we think that that's just, that's just too glib. And it doesn't, the facts don't bear it out. Yeah. But there's always a culture of blame, isn't there? It's easy to blame someone. This, okay, last question from this gentleman, I think. Brief. I had occasion to interview Dr. Norbert Bayos. Dr. Bayos was South Africa's, or one of South Africa's major specialists on TB over a long Can period. Can you speak up a little bit? Dr. Bayos was one of the great TB specialists. Um, she was the first clinician to identify a case of Peter Hockel's spectrum disorder in South Africa in 1978. If ASD, the South African prevalence of children at first level primary school in Northern and Cape Province is somewhere between 8 and 12 percent, which is several times higher than it is elsewhere in the world. I don't know how many people in this room have heard of it. Her comment to me was, when an issue is labeled a public health issue, it's not taken seriously. Yeah, I'll take this a comment. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. I think we really have to end now because the dinner will start soon. I want to thank you very, very much for being here in the first place, being at Kellogg in the second place, because that's wonderful for us, but also for a very enlightening and rather <coughs> freak me out kind of, <laughs> kind of discussion. Freak us out. Freak us out, definitely. <laughs> freak you out as well. So thank you, everyone.